Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Louisa Wood Ruby. I'm head of research here at the Frick Art Reference Library. And it's my pleasure today to welcome all of you to the first of our four part lecture series, Collecting Impressions, Six Centuries of Print Connoisseurship. Um, this will be held every Wednesday at 12 noon in October. Um, and the series was co-organized by the Frick Center for the History of Collecting and the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and is kindly supported um, by the International Fine Print Dealers Association Foundation. Um, on your screen, you can see a list of the links, uh, the titles and links to sign up for the following three Wednesdays. Please do so if you haven't. I'd now like to introduce one of my co-organizers, Nadine Ornstein, Drew Heinz Curator in Charge of the Department of Prints and Drawings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Nadine. Thank you, Louisa. Um, I just want to welcome everybody. This is a great turnout for this event. Um, Louisa, uh, Samantha Deutsch, um, Jennifer Farrell from the Met and I began working on this um, idea well over a year ago. Uh, it was meant to be a, a conference of about a day and a half. A little did we know it would turn into what it is now, which is a series of lectures over the next, uh, or lectures and interviews over the next four weeks, every Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Um, we eventually got Jenny Gibbs from the IFPDA involved, and um, we're really delighted uh, for how it turns out. Um, of course, we not, don't get to see everybody in person. Uh, we don't get to have our events um, either at the Met or in the Javits Center, but we do have about 700 people signed up for this event, so we're delighted to be able to really broaden the reach of this event. Um, you see on the screen right now the next, the coming uh, talks. I'm lo really looking forward to them. So now, without much further ado, I will pass things on to David Tunick, who's going to introduce our speaker, our keynote speaker for today, Anthony Griffith. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, hello, everyone. On behalf of the IFPDA, uh, which is the International Fine Print Dealers Association that Nadine referenced, uh, it is the IFPDA that is the body behind the online print fair and one of the organizers of Print Month, which begins today. It is the IFPDA Foundation that is providing the financial support for this series of lectures, beginning with today's lecture by the highly distinguished Anthony Griffiths. Anthony's resume is as long or longer than your proverbial arm, but here's something that's not on it. When someone comes to work for my firm, there are two books that are mandatory reading right at the start. Prints and Printmaking, an introduction to the history and techniques. And the second book is The Print Before Photography, an introduction to European printmaking 1550 to 1820. Both are by Anthony Griffiths. Both are brilliantly written and compelling from beginning to end. If anyone's name today is synonymous with scholarship in prints, it is Anthony's, a little of his background. He studied at Christ Church, Oxford, graduating with a BA degree, and at the Courtauld Institute of Art in London, graduating with an MA degree. He joined the British Museum's Department of Prints and Drawings as an assistant keeper in 1976. Within five years, he was promoted to deputy keeper, and in 1991, he was appointed keeper, the British title for head of the department, a position that he held for 20 years before retiring from the museum in 2011. Antony has lectured and published widely, all too numerous to mention here, but we cannot omit that he was a co-founder um, in, 1980, in 1984, of the most important scholarly journal in the print world, the Print Quarterly, and has served as the chairman since 2001. Nor can we omit that he also served as the Slade Professor of Fine Art at Oxford in 2014-15. He is a fellow of the British Academy and was awarded its highest medal in 2017. It is my privilege and my honor to turn the program over to Anthony Griffiths as our keynote and inaugural speaker for Print Month. Anthony, over to you. Um, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, and I should just introduce this lecture with a, uh, a bit of a description. 
I've chosen today to talk about a subject that is rarely discussed. And my reason for doing so is that I feel it is often misunderstood. I have read and heard statements from the more thoughtless members of the profession of art historians and museum curators that imply that dealers are the natural enemy of museums, collectors, and indeed anyone who loves works of art. Of course, there are bad dealers in the same way as there are bad collectors and bad curators. But a profession is not, designed, is not defined by what happens when it works badly. What counts is when it is working well. The often ignored or unrecognized truth is that a dealer and the collector are mutually dependent. You cannot form a collection without someone to buy from, and a print seller without a clientele to sell to would soon be bankrupt. Which comes first cannot be said. It is a case of the chicken and the egg. And this has been true since the beginning of European printmaking in the first half of the 15th century. The only development is that since the late 18th century, the traditional collector has been joined by another sort of collector, the, co the curator working for a museum or library or a private collector. And such cu curators are now a powerful force in the market. I was recently reading the novel by Bruce Chatwin entitled Oots, where Oots, who is a collector of mice and porcelain, says, the collector's enemy is the museum curator. Ideally, museums should be looted every 50 years and their collections return to circulation. Well, I don't know when the 50 years is up and it's fortunate for me that I'm now retired. But for the purposes of this talk, I shall assume that curators are just another sort of collector. My subject is still woefully under-researched and little is known about it. Print collectors and collections have only started to be investigated in the past 30 or 40 years and the print trade has hardly been examined at all. So in the time at my disposal, I shall only be able to offer some preliminary remarks. I shall concentrate on three periods, the early years during the 16th century, the peak of print culture in the 17th and 18th centuries, and I shall end with the present day. I feel I have some qualifications to talk about this subject, having over the past 35 years, while I was a curator in the British Museum, purchased, along with my colleagues, many thousands of prints of the collection, almost all of them from members of the print trade. I'm a collector myself, though not of prints, but among other things of medals. And here I show Chardin's view of people like myself. I have met and purchased from many different dealers and have been surprised to find that most of them are also collectors, you, though usually in a different field from the one in which they deal. So perhaps the dealer and the collector are not so different. I have also purchased, as my wife will confirm, far too many books, but I would never describe myself as a book collector. So let me begin with asking when a buyer of prints becomes a print collector. The answer once given to me by a collector is that you become one when you buy a print without knowing where you're going to hang it. This answer implies that the print is something like the one on the screen and is going to be kept framed. This would have started anyone before the late 19th century. Prints were indeed hung on the wall. A few collectors in those days would have framed a print. Most of them would have kept it loose in a portfolio or pasted into an album. It would also usually have been a much smaller subject than this Liechtenstein and would normally be black and white rather than in color. The concept of the print as something made to be used for room display and decoration is first found in the later 18th century and it only displaced the earlier understanding in the 1930s. We need to imagine ourselves back in the days before photography when every single printed image was hand printed from a copper plate or wooden block that had been cut by human skill. Such handmade prints served every function you can think of that is served by the mass produced images of the present day. I show here a book illustration, which is a diagram from a treatise on astronomy and a playing card, both of them printed from hand cut wooden blocks. The print that was regarded as a work of art in its own right, like this engraving by Martin Schonger, the sort of print that was bought to be admired rather than used, was a small part of the market. It was given its own name. In the Netherlands, it was called the Kunstprint, the art print. 
In those pre-photographic days, everyone was a buyer of prints, but only a few were collectors of prints. Let us now consider the print seller. This was a term used at the time, and the term print dealer is a modern variation. The print seller of the early modern world dealt indiscriminately in old and new prints. Few do this today. When the print was a new category of production at the beginning of the 15th century, there were no second-hand prints, and the new prints were sold by the engravers themselves. It took some generations before a middleman trade of the print publisher emerged. It took equally long for a second-hand market to develop, and we must ask how and why such a trade was created. A sheet of paper is a flimsy thing and is very easy to damage and destroy. It takes a deliberate effort to keep it in good condition so that it can survive over many years. A print like the Shangar on the screen has probably, probably been through the hands of 15 or 20 owners who have looked after it carefully. The simple reason for the development of the second homes market is that engraving was a medium taken up in the years before and after 1500 by some artists of genius, of whom the most famous are Dürer, Lucas van Leiden, and Marc Antonio Raimondi, who worked in partnership with Raphael in Rome. The subjects of their prints were often more ambitious than the subjects of their paintings. Entire monographs have been devoted to trying to explain the subject of Dürer's melancholia. Such prints were something entirely new in the development of European art, and they were widely admired by the art lovers of the day, who purchased their prints in order to keep and admire them. To do this, they pasted them in albums, and when these albums were sold, a new market developed. Here is Marc Antonio's engraving after one of Raphael's most ambitious designs, which he drew specifically in order to create this print. During the 16th century, the same dealers handled both new and old prints, but their customers were equally likely to be equally interested in both. Not many consprenten yet existed, and it was still theoretically possible to acquire everything of interest. The only names that we know today are of the publishers who owned the plates. This is because they put their names on them in order to make it clear where more stock could be obtained but the words Ant Salamanca excluded, which you see at the bottom of this slide, which means that Antonio Salamanca published it, would be of no help to anyone who did not live in Rome in the 1540s. This information was meant for members of the trade rather than collectors. And this tells us that there was already a supporting cast of middlemen, the distributors and retailers, about whom we know next to nothing. We have very little knowledge of who these dealers were and how this new role developed, which stood between the maker and the buyer. We do know that a key element in forming the supply chain were the great trade fairs of the day. The largest of these was at Frankfurt, and this is where people came together from all over Europe. Publishers, wholesalers and retailers had to meet in person and build up trust in order to exchange stock and arrange the terms of payment. This involved credit lines that might stretch as far as a year ahead in complicated bookkeeping. In many countries, France especially, this part of the business became the province of the prince seller's wives, who played a critical role in the trade. We have one important piece of information about these early years in the form of a letter from the great printer and publisher Christopher Plantin in Antwerp to a client in Padua who wanted to buy some engravings by Dürer. Plantin explained that impressions from the same plate of Dürer could vary in price by as much as four times, and that although this might seem crazy, that was how the market worked. This letter was written in 1567, not quite 40 years after Dürer's death, and it reveals two important facts. One is that the market for prints was already in and the second is that there was already a developed connoisseurship that cared about the quality of impression and would pay a large premium to get the best available. The dreadful late impression of the Dürer on the screen at the right shows why the willingness to pay more for a better impression must have been there right from the beginning. 
We can find evidence to support this in Carol van Mander's biographies of Netherlandish artists published in 1604. He recorded that Lucas van Leyden had destroyed any inferior impressions of his prints and had charged a very high price, a gold gilder, for those that he had passed for sale. Lucas died in 1533, and by the end of the 1500s, there was a huge vogue for his prints among art lovers in the Netherlands, as there was for Dürer's prints in Germany. This explains the virtuoso imitations of Lucas's manner seen in this engraving by the great Harlem engraver, Hendrik Goltzius. Goltzius was himself a passionate collector of Lucas's work. And when it came to printing this plate, he used a specially prepared gray toned ink in order to imitate the silvery quality by which connoisseurs distinguished the best impressions of Lucas's work from the intense blacks used by Dürer. The years around 1600 were the first great peak of print collecting and traces of the collections formed then survived to the present day. I show a drawing of the tombstone of the 15th century engraver Israel van Mechenen. This drawing is the only evidence for the death a date of Israel's death in 1503, and it was commissioned by an unknown collector around 1600 to serve as a frontispiece to two astonishing albums which he had put together that contained no fewer than 854 engravings of the 15th and early 16th centuries. The two albums were broken up in a sale in London in 1799, and their contents must have supplied most of the early northern engravings now in English collections, such as this one acquired by the British Museum in 1806. By the beginning of the 17th century, the understanding and expertise in prints was as great as that of anyone living before the advances in historical research that began in the early 19th century. So this is a point at which we can pause and consider who these men were, but they were mostly men, and how they work together. I shall begin with the collectors. You cannot collect without the funds to do so. And the great collectors primarily came from the professional classes, state officials such as Cardinal Granville, who was secretary to Emperor Charles V, lawyers, doctors, clerics, as well as artists themselves. Some of the men who collected on a more modest scale specialized in areas they found of particular interest, such as portraits or topography. Diaries sometimes reveal how such collectors made their purchases. Robert Hooke was one of the early members of the Royal Society in London and the surveyor behind the rebuilding of London after the Great Fire of 1666. He maintained a diary in which he recalled calling into the shop of Richard Thompson whenever he happened to be walking through the Covent Garden area of London and buying a few prints that appealed to him. He was not looking for anything in particular. It was a form of leisure activity to divert him from more pressing concerns. This portrait, you see, is one of the earliest known of a London print seller and was published by another print seller, um, Pierce Tempest, almost certainly after Thompson's death in 1693. This again tells us something important about print sellers, that all members of the trade then and now knew each other but they had to cooperate if they were to flourish. They were professional rivals, but this did not stop them from forming friendships and publishing this memorial portrait was the act of a friend. The names of the biggest and richest collectors are often revealed in the dedication of prints. Making a large engraving after the works of the great Flemish artists such as Rubens or Van Dyck was a lengthy and expensive project that demanded the involvement of the painter who supplied the painting or drawing, as well as of the engraver and usually a publisher who put up the funds and sought of the sale of the print itself. These two prints of Charles I and his queen after Van Dyck are not strictly a pair, but they were produced by the same publisher, artist and engraver, and both were dedicated to Charles van den Bosch, Druge, who was a major print collector of the day. Van den Bosch, would have thanked the publisher by making a substantial gift as a form of subsidy towards the cost of making these prints. As Count of Alberg Wolfegg 
was a contemporary of the Bishop of Bruges, and most of his print collection still survives in the family castle in Germany. He was proud of the size of his hoard. In, 15, in 1654, he owned, he said, 14,057 large sheets, 85,511 of the middle size, 22,489 of the small size, as well as 895 prints by Holler and a collection of 34,000 prints he had just bought from the estate of Count Fugger. The total came to 157,022, and the Count asked the dealer Jan Meissens, from whom he was buying, to find out whether the Bishop of Bruges owned as many. This reveals something of the character of the collector. Collecting is rarely an activity carried out in isolation. It is an unorthodox way to spend money, and most people who are not collectors cannot understand the compulsion. So it requires constant affirmation and support from fellow collectors. Every collector needs to be accepted into his or her peer group. And those who are ambitious wish to be admired and envied by them. It is a curious combination of sociability and competitiveness, and showing off your collection was and remains the best way to achieve this status. This is one reason why collectors spent much, such time and expense into arranging their prints onto the leaves of albums, amounting them beautifully. I show here a page of small landscapes by Sebastian Leclerc as mounted in an early 18th century album, and you can see the care that was taken to trim the print prints to the plate mark and line them up precisely. You must ignore the nasty pencil annotations added by modern curators such as myself. The huge majority of pre-19th century prints that exist today own their survival to having been protected within the covers of an album. This explains why early prints almost invariably have their margins cut off. You have to do this if you want your prints to look good in an album. Any margin left on the print destroys the symmetry of the page arrangement. So any print that you see today, which has had its margins trimmed, you can be sure was once in an album. Let us now look at the print sellers. They also formed a wide range of types of person. We first need to put aside those engravers, and there are many of them, who sold directly to their collectors. When you read the lettering on the 18th century print, that it was sold by so-and-so and such and such a dress. You can see the enlargement at the bottom here. This constitutes an invitation to go to that address and buy directly from the engraver. Print shops came in all shapes and sizes, and most large towns would have had one. Large cities would have had many. A small print seller offering new prints as a commodity to a general public required few skills. An English writer in 1747 was very critical of the profession, and I quote, our print shopkeepers are mere tradesmen. They set up anything that offers in their shops. If it sells, their end is answered. They are no more judges of the intrinsic worth of the commodity than they are of astronomy. What a pity it is that the dealers in all other commodities know their properties and how to discern their beauties and faults. Yet those who deal in letters and the sale of the works of the muses are so monstrously ignorant of everything relating to what they sell. On the screen here is one of the few interior views we have of a medium-sized print shop. It shows Dorothy Mercier, the wife of the painter Philip Mercier, with her customers, and this is about 80, uh, 1750. This is the sort of shop where you start your life as a collector, buying a few prints that appeal to you, becoming friendly with the proprietor, and moving on to specialise in a particular area once you had decided what you were looking for. The proprietors range from those who knew little, as we just heard, to those who are experts. In the large cities, many would have come, become specialists in particular areas. Dorothy Mercier here, small, a middle-sized, smaller-sized print, dealer were to have got her stock of new prints, mainly from the big print publishers of the day, such as James Sayre, a uh, big pardon, Robert Sayre, um, who issued a printed catalogue of the plates that he owned in 1766, which you can see. Retailers would have placed orders from this and give, been given a trade discount, which was standardly 25% on the retail price. 
Beyond these sedentary shopkeepers were the dealers who were constantly on the road visiting other dealers and important collectors. If they became the preferred supplier to big and wealthy collectors, their career was made. Here is Jan Meissens in 1649, and the Latin text below, I beg your pardon, French text below, explains that he began life as a painter and was indeed still painting portraits, but that he was now mainly concerned with selling prints in the knowledge of which, it says, he was singularly versed. Meissens actually became the agent for Count Valberg Bolfig, who we just seen, and sent him handwritten lists of prints he had in stock. He already knew what Valberg Wolfegg already possessed, and so only listed the prints that he knew were lacking in his collection. Two of these letters happen to survive, but this is a part of the business which is very difficult for the historian to track. Most dealers at this time, like Jan Meissens, began as painters or engravers, and modern art history concentrates on this aspect of their lives and ignores everything else that they did. In later centuries, and certainly today, the more usual route towards acquiring the necessary expertise was to work for an established older dealer, becoming acquainted, acquainted with other dealers and the principal collectors, and then one day setting up on your own. Such a career path usually escapes the records on which art historians rely. The part of the business we know most about is the top end, the wealthy elite of big dealers who worked internationally, often in family firms that continued through several generations. These were men such as the Mariettes in Paris, John and Josiah Boydell in London, and the Rossi dynasty in Rome. They became very rich. John Boydell became John Lord Mayor of London, and the Rossi built this palace you see here on the geniculum. All of them began as publishers of new plates, but gradually extended their activities into second hand, or as we would say, antiquarian trade. The scale of their operations could be breathtaking. When John V of Portugal decided to form a print collection in 1724, using the wealth pouring in to him from Brazil, he first ordered from the Mariettes in Paris an impression of every print currently published in France. And he later extended this to an impression of every print that had ever been published in France. Even this was no problem, and the Marriotts duly delivered well over 100 volumes of prints, which were later destroyed in the Great Lisbon Earthquake of 1755. The album cover you see here is one of only three that survived from his collection and comes from a parallel collection of Italian prints he ordered in Rome, although we don't know who made it. In the 1710s, the Marriott firm also put together a ranged, mounted and catalogued, another huge collection for Eugene of Savoy. This was later acquired by the Holy Roman Emperor and is now the foundation of the Albertina in Vienna. They made a third collection for the Duke of Mortemar in Paris, a smaller collection of a mere few dozen albums for John Spencer in England, and undoubtedly other collections that we don't yet know about. There has been nothing like it before or since. The last of the Marriott family, Jean-Pierre here, became so wealthy that he sold up the business in 1750 and devoted the rest of his life to improving his inherited collection of drawings and prints. These were sold in Paris in 1775 after his death in what was certainly the greatest print auction ever held anywhere. One of Marriott's few albums that survive today is a print by or after Parmigianino. It's now in a Metropolitan Museum in New York, and I show a page from it, again with recent curatorial annotations. Selling prints to collectors at the top level required a combination of different talents. You had to know people from whom you could buy and collectors to whom you could sell. You needed to know what was common and what was rare and the price structure of the market. You had to know about the history of art and of printmaking, who were the great names and which were the great prints. Anyone can tell the difference between a good and a bad impression. The necessary skill was to recognize the difference between a very fine and a magnificent impression. A good visual memory was essential and some dealers had such astonishing memories that they never forgot any impression of a print that they had seen. A few people today still have this ability. 
Substantial working capital was necessary to build up stock and wait for payment. It was essential to build up trust. To act as the intermediary between vendors and buyers required tact, affability, and charm. You needed a sixth sense for changing interests and fashion and an eye for opportunities in new markets. You had to have the nerve to pay and ask exceptional prices. And you had to be enough of a gambler to be willing to take on risks, which might on occasion become huge. Such a combination of skills was not common, and it was, was and remains little appreciated by the general public. This lampoon of not print but picture dealers at work was made in 1800. There were two major developments in the print trade. The first was the rise of the auction. Trade auctions of stocks of copper plates and such like can be traced back in Holland to the early years of the 17th century. But it was in the 1680s and 90s in England that auctions were opened up to collectors as well as to the trade. One of the first auctioneers was Edward Millington, who sold his stock at the then fashionable spa town of Tunbridge Wells during the summer season when it was full of wealthy visitors with time in their hands. He flattered his customers in a preface to a catalogue of 1690. We thought fit for the benefit of the virtuosos and more understanding gentry to select out of vast numbers, such as for their fairness and rarity of their blackness will doubtless be admired by all that see them. Such persons only are desired to come. Those which are slight or defaced are being reserved for another time and place and another sort of per people. So it is no surprise to discover that faked and doctored of impressions were already a problem in the 17th century. Copyists became adroit at recreating missing lines in pen and ink. The top half of this print is entirely drawn in pen. Though actually this may have been done later. Auctions quickly became part of the social world, a place where aristocrats and commoners rubbed shoulders and competed on an equal footing. Collectors would meet each other and be spurred to further emulation by seeing what their friends and rivals were doing. Collectors, while wanting the prints that others possessed, also wished to distinguish their collection from others. Such friendly rivalry led to a premium being put on rarity. As Ellen Gloomy wrote in 1751, when they published the first catalogue of etchings by Rembrandt, the amour propre of a collector is always flattered to possess a piece that is almost unique, even when the more common state is more beautiful. This reminds me of the late lamented Lucien Goldschmidt in New York, who once gave me his own take on rarity. Show me a print that is unique, and I'll show you one that is uniquer. Before the second half of the 18th century, there was almost no printed literature available on prints. The main source of information was people's memories, and this put good print sellers in a strong position, for they had seen more and knew more than their clients. So the creation of a printed literature that collectors could use became the second of the major developments that I mentioned. This was the achievement of an outstanding dealer in Paris, Edmond François Gessin, who is now best known for the shop sign that Vato painted for him. Gessin was a collector himself, and his business was a way of financing his passion, not just for prints, but for drawings, shells, porcelain, and ormolu. He realized that prices for prints was much lower in the Netherlands than in Paris. And between 1734 and 50, traveled 12 times to Holland to acquire stock, which he then auctioned in Paris. His catalogues for these sales were something new, for he poured his own expertise into their pages, adding introductory sections to each introductory essays to each section, comments to the individual lots, and excellent biographies where appropriate. The listing of the work of Callot in his 1744 catalogue of the collection of Quentin de Loranger not only described the prints in the sale with great precision and elegance, but added every print, missing print that he knew in other collections. His catalogues became standard reference works for more than a century, and they created a new generation of collectors. Gessin also compiled the first catalogue of Rembrandt's etchings, which was published shortly after his premature death in 1750. His pioneering example released a dam of hitherto unpublished material. 
And during the next 50 years, numerous catalogues, handbooks and dictionaries were published that made it possible to record what was known, and thereby to make progress. Knowledge is incremental and each author builds on his or her predecessor's work. The availability and pooling of information gave rise to a third major development, the creation of a new sort of expert in the form of the curator. Their model is Adam Bartsch, a fine etcher who was appointed to the Imperial Library in Vienna to look after the collection of Eugenia Savoy. It was Bartsch who published between 1803 and 21 the volumes, 21 of them, entitled Le Peintre Graveur, using as his basis the manuscript list that Pierre-Jean Mariette had placed at the front of each of Eugenia Savoy's volumes. Bartsch's books are still in use today. This flood of information lay behind a great boom in print collecting across Europe, which lasted from about 1770 to the mid-1820s. The market had expanded so much that we find dealers emerging who were not involved in publishing and who made successful careers dealing only in antiquarian prints. You see here an etching with the heads of 22 such dealers made from sketches drawn during auctions held in London in the 1780s. William Blake, who is now so famous as a poet, was by trade an engraver and remarked in 1800, there are now, I believe, as many booksellers as there are butchers and as many print shops as of any other trade. We remember when a print shop was a rare bird in London. One of these small print shops was run for some years by his wife, Catherine, whom a contemporary praised for being an excellent saleswoman who, I quote, never committed the mistake of showing too many things at one time. This boom, as always, attracted criticism and complaints. It caused an unprecedented rise in prices of a kind that was not repeated until the 1870s. This was most clearly evident in newly published prints, which sometimes doubled in value within a few years. This was new and some contemporaries were horrified. One of these was the second generation Parisian print seller, Charles-François Joulin, who published a small book of reflections on painting and engraving in 1786. He complained bitterly that the world of print collecting was being invaded by a new breed of speculator and blamed this on the rise of auctions and the way in which they made rising prices visible to all. This, he thought, encouraged short-term trading rather than true collecting. Such comments can, if you like, be dismissed as those of a traditional dealer being sidelined by another way of selling, but his complaints may sound familiar today with the rise of selling on the internet. The 19th century saw huge changes in the print trade as the idea of what a print was, was disrupted by the new technologies of lithography and, photo and photography, and the print trade changed with them. By the 20th century, the 19th century trade in engravings and framing, uh, such as the print you see here, and this is the basis of the new print trade at the time, had been transformed into a trade in photomechanical reproductions of paintings printed from four color litho presses. And the handmade print had retreated into a smaller trade in prints published in signed and limited editions. Signatures had been employed since the mid 19th century in large engravings such as this one, but numbering did not become regular until well into the 20th century. This dry point by Christopher Nevinson of 1921 is signed, but it is not numbered. Signing and numbering are now regarded as defining characteristics of an artist's print, and people often forget that it is simply a fairly recently invented way of creating an artificial scarcity and thereby, hopefully, increasing demand. In such ways, the concept of the artists and collectors' prints has been redefined. This has now taken over from the earlier concept of the print as any handmade image printed from a wooden block or copper plate and has allowed the modern print, while being the product of the design and supervision of an artist, to embrace a wide range of types of involvement of that artist, which can often vary from one print to another. I will not say more about the past two centuries, but will move into modern times from my own experience. I first worked in the British Museum in 1970, and so my memories go back 50 years. 
Let me describe what I see as the main changes over this period. In London in the 1970s, there was still a wide range of print dealers, though I was told that even then these were fewer than before. At the top of the trade was Colnaghi's in Bond Street, which held two or three exhibitions of prints a year with price catalogues. They had three or four staff in a large upstairs office surrounded by boxes of prints and filing drawers full of cards on which were handwritten the prices that each print had fetched in auctions since the First World War. Lower down the market was Craddock and Barnard, very close to the British Museum, where you could buy nice prints for a few pounds. Many novice collectors such as myself found their feet by looking through these boxes. Those who remember it might enjoy these photographs, which were taken a few days before it closed in 1986. Colnaghi's were unusual in dealing in both early and modern prints. For during the first half of the 20th century, a divide had opened up between the trade in old masters and the trade in modern prints. Modern began with Goya, Romanticism, and the beginnings of photography. For the earlier years, there were specialist shops that dealt in portraits, topography, and caricatures, as well as small general shops that at the bottom end merged into the junk shop. The large Victorian print after paintings that had been admired at the Royal Academy in London or the Salon in Paris had by then fallen completely out of favour and sight. I was told that in the 1950s and 60s, you could find piles of unsold 19th century engravings like this one on the pavements of Bond Street, waiting for the garbage collectors to clear them away. By the time I had arrived in the 1970s, modern had changed and come to refer to anything since Impressionism. In other words, prints by famous artists, mostly of the School of Paris. These had their own dealers, some of whom also handled contemporary prints, which then meant prints published since the Second World War. Christie's, Sotheby's and Phillips all had print departments and each held three or four sales a year. This is already a big drop in the 1950s and 60s, when there are dozens of print auctions every year. There were no fairs and no private dealers who worked out without a shop. I did not know the New York trade as well as I knew the London one, but what I saw in the 1980s seemed to me recognisably similar, although there was a far greater interest in modern prints. In 2020, very little of the world of the antiquarian prints survives in London. <clears throat> one or two of the same dealers remain active, some are semi-retired, and few new dealers have emerged to take the place of those who have gone. The old print shop has more or less disappeared, and there are now only two shops in London where you can walk in off the street and look through a stock of old prints. Though I must add that this is still quite easy in Paris. There are some private dealers in London, but you have to know where they work and make an appointment to see them, and this is a very different sort of experience from calling into a shop. The big auctioneers hold far fewer sales, and the print trade of the new millennium has been reshaped around fairs, a small one in London and a big one in New York. The London Fair began in 1985, and I remember that the first fair was dominated by dealers in traditional prints between the 15th century and Picasso. There were a few brave publishers of new prints, and I remember feeling very sorry for them since there seemed to be little interest in their material. This has now changed completely, and the proportions have reversed. There are now only a few dealers in earlier material, and the overwhelming majority of exhibitors are publishers of new prints. The offering is not so unbalanced in a much bigger New York fair, but still only a minority of exhibitors offer prints earlier than, say, 1800. How do we explain such a dramatic change? It is sometimes said that the supply has dried up and there's nothing left to buy. Certainly, the disappearance of the print shop, priced out in many cities by huge increases in rents, has not helped a new generation of collectors to emerge. But a supply usually emerges to meet a demand, and it is equally reasonable to say that it is the demand that has collapsed. Large share Large areas of traditional collecting have gone out of fashion. Very few seem to be interested in the great line engravings after old master paintings and portraits, or the specialist printmakers such as Callow and Della Bella, who dominated collecting until the end of the 19th century. The traditional highlights of many collections have been forgotten. 
takes Sebastien Leclerc, who was such a great name in the 18th century and much of the 19th. The story behind this print used to be familiar to every collector. It shows Alexander the Great entering captured Babylon in triumph in the extraordinary carriage drawn by elephants that you see in the center left. When Louis XIV was shown the print, he pronounced that a great leader ought never to be shown in profile, but in full face. He was, of course, thinking of himself. So Leclerc had to alter the plate. And you can see here Alexander looking towards you full face. The first state inevitably became a highly sought after rarity. Underlying the changes I've been talking about is something that in itself has nothing specifically to do with prints. The recent has overtaken the past as a subject of contemporary interest. Post-war paintings and sculptures now fetch far more than all but the most exceptional world master paintings. As a result, traditional areas of European collecting have retreated into small specialist areas. Where do we see historic medals, gems and cameos? They threaten to go the way of shells and drop out of the sight of the art world. Even ceramics, glass, furniture, metalwork, and other primary areas of the decorative arts seem to have become matters of specialist rather than general interest. Such fundamental changes of taste cannot be explained. They just happen, but there can be no doubt that the globalized world created by modern communications has played a large role in this. A huge gap has opened up between the works that have international recognition and everything else, and everything else suffers in consequence. This narrowing down of the field to concentrate in prints made by artists with instant recognition makes life increasingly difficult for the dealer and the collector of earlier prints. The dealer finds it problematic to make a living, the collector loses his or her peer group and the status and recognition that it gives. Yet the past 50 years have been a golden age for advances in knowledge about prints and more has been published about them than ever before. When I began in 1976, there are few books that were worth buying to refer to at home. I now have six shelves of useful material. Many museums have mounted exhibitions in particular areas of printmaking with catalogues that have advanced knowledge and made the subject far more accessible. One of these is the recent catalogue of a mess and early etching to which the IFPDA has just awarded one of its annual prizes. There are new journals since as such as Print Quarterly, founded in 1984, which I hope I may be pardoned for mentioning, because as David Tunick said, I'm the chairman of the non-profit charity that runs it. Most importantly of all, within the past 15 years, many museums, galleries and libraries in Europe and America have begun to publish online catalogues of their prints with good color pictures that can be downloaded. These catalogues, as and when they are completed, will transform the field of print studies. Well, we are where we are. The contemporary rules the market and the past suffers, but the relationship between the dealer and the collector remains the same, whatever prints are being acquired. The good dealer can still provide information and expertise that is otherwise unobtainable, and the intelligent collector still needs to learn from a good dealer how to buy wisely and well. So long as prints are being produced and collected, this dynamic will never cease. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Anthony. Anthony. That was, that was a, fascinating a fascinating talk, talk a, great a great overview, overview of, the of the history of, of collecting, uh, collecting prints. And, prints. and um, there have been a few questions for you. Uh, and also, if you have questions, please feel free to write them into the Q&A section. Um, the first one uh, from Eileen Carr, which came up as you were talking about the albums from the Mariette, is how large might these albums be? Well, um, they're, they're large folios. I mean, they're very big, very big things. Um, you'll get about 80, 90 pages, sheets per album. And you, depending on the size of the prints, you could have anything from 12 to one print on it. If, I hope that's an answer. 
I think that's an answer. <laughs> um, another question comes uh, from someone. Uh, what would royalty do with print portraits of themselves? Give them out to relatives or others or display them when company would come over? <laughs> would they ever hang them as they did with painted portraits? Well, portrait prints are a very special category. There's not many portraits that the general public wanted to buy. I mean, unless they're specialist collectors but you couldn't sell them in a print shop unless they were either a notorious prostitute, um, someone in the news, a sports star, someone on a stage or something like that. Things don't change much. If you had the portrait of the Earl of Sandwich or someone completely obscure like that, you'd be very sure that that's virtually un unsaleable. And the only person who would buy it would be the Earl himself and his friends. So most of these, um, if you like, prints of very obscure people were private plates, privately commissioned, and all the impressions are actually handed out as gifts to their friends and relations or to people who they wanted to try and um, influence. All right. Um, Andrea Morgan asks, uh, th says, thank you so much for this talk. Is there much literature on Dorothy Mercier or other British female print dealers or collectors like her? <clears throat> Very quick answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good dissertation topic. <laughs> yes, and the entire print trade is um, way open. I mean, when I said that nothing much has been published, I mean it, and there is very little published about it. Okay, uh, Mike Abbott asks, where are the two shops in London, the two print current print shops in London that you mentioned? <laughs> well, <laughs> a free advertisement. Um, one is Grosvenor Prints in Covent Garden, and the other is Andrew Ed Edmonds in Lexington Street. All right. Um, how does the copywriting of images figure into the sale of prints historically? And that comes from Julie Melby. How does the copywriting of images figure into the sale of prints historically? Oh. <laughs> well, like, that demands about two weeks of reply. <laughs> um, um, copyright in print was um, always very vexed. You could get um, a privilege, as it was called, usually in most countries um, to protect a print within that country but the moment you cross the borders that was it there was nothing to protect you um, um, there was no co international copyright agreements before the, the late 19th century so uh, so that the piracy of prints a copying of them was endemic across Europe if something um, successful came out in Paris you could be very sure that copies would emerge in Augsburg Nuremberg Amsterdam, Antwerp, within weeks, well, months, maybe even weeks. Um, so the market was in effect confined to your own country. They didn't like it, but there's nothing you could do about it. <laughs> um, Sabina Fogel asks, as a print collector yourself, could you share with us where your purchases, uh, where you purchase some of your first prints and have any of your favorite dealers shut down? Also, do you collect maps as well? Uh, no, I don't collect maps. Um, I don't collect printed music. I don't collect playing cards. There's all sorts of printed material I, I don't collect. I'm not a print collector. I buy a few. You can see a few behind me in the walls. And I bought a few in my early days, at, at, almost entirely at Craddock and Barnard. Um, and um, that was where I learned a lot about um, you know, price structure and the rest of it. Because when you work in a museum, you don't know much about prices. Yeah. Um, have many print shops shut down? Yes. Um, Kalnagi's is the one we all lament the most. Um, I should say someone uh, in uh, response to the Dorothy Mercier uh, question, Kelsey Martin writes, look out for an incoming edited volume on 18th century female printmakers, print sellers and publishers coming soon. So. Very good. Well, at least I can't be expected to have read it already. Yeah. <laughs> You're off the hook. Um, let me see. There's a lot of questions coming in, so I'm sort of uh, popping around here. Um, someone asked, uh, what would a typical print run of a late 18th century mezzotint be? A mezzotint, very different from an engraving. A mezzotint Ah, uh, depends whether you wanted good impressions or not. If you wanted good impressions, no more than two or three hundred. If you wanted anything to sell, you could push it up a lot. And those, when you did push it up, they're usually 
sold coloured because the colouring disguised the wear. Um, okay, Stéphane Roy says, uh, asks, the internet plays a significant role in connecting dealers and collectors today. Would you say that newspapers played a similar, similar role in the 17th and 18th century? No, I don't, no, I don't think so. I think it would have been print shops where people would meet each other and auctions. Those are the places where people met. Uh, Stephanie Dickey wonders, how did the huge prints price differential between original and reproductive prints develop? Um, how did it or when did it? Um, when it asked how, but maybe how? when might be a better <laughs> question. Well, I think it's certainly developed since the last war, um, at least the, the very wide gulf. Um, I mean, I should explain to those who don't know what we're talking about. An original print is a print which is made by the, as it were, it's an original creation by the artist. It is a drawing created as a print, whereas a reproductive print is um, on the whole made by a professional engraver in the attempt to reproduce a painting or some other work. Um, as I say, it's, it's since the war that that, um, has become a, 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 a huge gulf. Um, and the trouble now, the trouble for this, I think is very simple, that the reproductive print has been assimilated to a photograph. And in other words, why bother with these prints? So the photography does it a lot better. Whereas an original print of the sort of thing that a Dürer or Rembrandt or a Goya would have done, um, is very obviously a work of art that we can all understand. Um, so, um, as well, what we have to relearn is um, an ability to admire the achievements of the line engravers, um, who were astonishing virtuosos. And um, I started by thinking, well, you, know, you take it for granted. And when you realize what's actually involved, and I can't go that into this here, um, I do a bit in my big book, um, you realize that these were astonishing virtuosos who were fully... Uh, as brilliant craftsmen as anything you find in the decorative arts. Okay, I will just finish up with one last question. Um, Crystal Trevisan says, thank you for a fantastic talk. Where would you start to look for the names of sellers of prints in the 18th century? Would they be mentioned in population census as a profession or should I look for booksellers? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, the obvious place uh, for 18th century sellers of prints is to look in the prints themselves. They usually have a pop, uh, publication line along the bottom, as one I showed did, and it's that publication line which will give you the names and addresses. What it won't tell you is whether they were a small print seller or a very big one. You have to look at an awful lot of these prints to get some idea. However, there is a wonderful dictionary done by Maxime Préau and colleagues in France of um, uh, print um, publishers of the Ancien Régime, which goes up to the revolution. And that is a wonderful reference book. And unfortunately, there's nothing like that for any other country. Mm. There is a good, now I can't, of course the name <laughs> escapes me. Uh, there is one, uh, not a book, but there is a, uh, a dictionary for Holland where they do have a list of print sellers and uh, I will send it to you <laughs> when I remember the name of the author. Anyway, thank you so much, Anthony. This was a fantastic talk. And I will now turn it over to David Tunick uh, to um, finish up here. And, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine and Anthony. That was really uh, great, uh, packed with lots of information, lots of new information. It was Stimulating, I found it stimulating, uh, informative, and a tremendous pleasure to listen to uh, both of you. Could not have been better. Uh, the IFPDA, which I represent, uh, and the IFPDA Foundation, would also like to thank all our cultural partners at museums across the country. But for this series, we would like especially to express our gratitude to Louisa Wood Ruby and Samantha Deutsch of the Frick Collection Center for the history of collecting, and also David Morneau, the Frick's technical guru overseeing these events. Also, thank you to our own IFPDA, energetic, creative, tireless, the adjectives could go on, for our own executive director, Jenny Gibbs, for being the principal driver of the entire print month program, 
Uh, this series of talks represents months of conversations and planning with many of our members and with curators all over the country. The series provides the bedrock upon which we expanded what has traditionally been known as Print Week into Print Month. Hope to see you again next week and before then as visitors perhaps to the IFPDA Fine Art Print Fair online. The link to register, as Nadine mentioned, um, for the remaining three lectures is in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can also go to the events calendar on the Frick website. Thank you all for attending today. Be safe and please stay healthy.